Congestive heart failure is actually kind of ranks up there with uh, urinary retention as one of the fun things to treat. It's almost immediately gratifying in the emergency department. You can take somebody who's very uncomfortable, very sick, and just get them back in line um, very, very easily. So it is a, a very, very easy thing to, um, to take care of, and it's very gratifying because they do get better right before your eyes. Um, the first article talks about nasiratide, um, and it's basically the um, uh, recombinant form of brain-type uh, naturetic peptide, BMP. It's a diagnostic test that, that we use a lot. Uh, anymore to diagnose CHF, um, but this talks about more the therapeutic aspects of it. We're not going to talk about the diagnostic as aspects of it. And if you look at congestive heart failure, first thing you have to remember is congestive heart failure is a combination of two things. It's mostly an afterload problem. It's generally not a, um, uh, a preload problem. It's rarely uh, a primary myocardial problem. It's mostly an afterload problem. These people are, um, have um, elevated peripheral vascular resistance because of that. They can't um, empty out the left ventricle. The left ventricle um, backs up blood into the lungs. Blood gets backed up into the lungs, transudates into the alveoli. You get fluid in the alveoli. That gives you the rails, the pink frosty sputum, and all that type of stuff. Management approach is, is very, very straightforward. You've got, um, and I, I love this analogy, it's basically, if you look at it, the lungs as a bathtub, you got two problems. You got the faucet on and the fluids running into the bathtub and the drain being too small so the fluid can't get out. So the first thing you want to do is you generally stop the, um, the fluid coming back into the lungs, which are the things you do to drop the, the preload, which is um, peripheral vasodilators that work on the venous side. And then you work on things that would, would uh, work on getting the, the drain opened up a little bit, which is you drop the afterload. And if you do that, uh, all of a sudden the, the bathtub empties and the lungs clear out. So if you've got not the world's greatest ventricle and you can stop fluid from pouring into the lungs and you can drop the afterload so the ventricle can empty out better, um, things will get... Um, uh, the people should get um, improved pretty dra dramatically. So if you looked at one drug that was going to do that, nasiratide looks like it should work. It's a vasodilator, so it peripherally vasodilates these people. It produces a naturesis, so they'll get a little bit of, of diuresis from it, blocks renin angiotensin, and it drops the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and the systemic vascular resistance. So this looks like a drug that should treat pulmonary edema fairly well. But the first article is the, um, uh, the VMAX study. 489 congestive heart failure patients, they were relegated to either nasiratide, nitroglycerin, or placebo. Now, number one, the fact that you had a placebo arm tells you these people weren't all that sick. Um, because if you've got a placebo arm in somebody with bad pulmonary edema or CHF, they're probably not that sick. But what they found is they had these different scales. One was a dyspnea scale, um, and the other was the global clinical status scale, which is, how you doing there, Mr. Smith, you know, type of thing. And they, they said, I feel much better and they got a different score for that. And what they found was when you compared nitroglycerin to nasiratide to placebo, there was really no difference in any of those things. But there was a drop in the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. It went from 5.8 to 3.8. That's not a big drop. I mean, when you think about, you know, somebody's got a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure of 30 because they're in pulmonary edema, it's not going to make a big difference on them. But they argued based on that study that it should be a first-line drug. Well, that got a lot of people's hackles up because it, as a first-line drug, it is extremely expensive, and it didn't blow away nitroglycerin. It didn't include what is normal treatment for congestive heart failure. It's not just nitroglycerin, which drops the preload, but a, a therapy that will drop the afterload as well. So they really only gave half of standard therapy, and then the serotide didn't do that well. So a lot of people got a little bit annoyed at this and went back and began to poke away at the, um, uh, the idea of using this drug on a first-line basis. Number two is an editorial that questions the conclusions. They said, if you really go back and look at that VMAX study, a couple of things happened. The serotide group was more likely to discontinue therapy, 4.8% versus 3.2%. The serotide had a higher 90-day mortality, 19% versus 13%, uh, which scares the, the bejesus out of me. How many people have uh, about 20% of their CHF patients dying on you? That's a lot of people. We're the, um, the primary care docs. You guys have 20% of your CHF patients dying on you in um, 90 days? That's, that's, I mean, that's all, I mean, and from the emergency department standpoint, we get them out of the department, but um, I don't think they die because I see them next week. Uh, so I, I don't, I think most of those people do well. So these numbers seem awful high. Mean length to stay was two days longer in the CRTI group, and it also is very, very expensive because 40 times as much as the nitroglycerin. Number three and number four also uh, criticize it. Um, number three looked at um, the effect on renal function in uh, 1,300 patients. The nasiratide-treated patients increased their creatinine 
0.5 milligrams per deciliter. Um, this, um, actually, I'm sorry, they looked at it, a bump in the creatinine, 21% of the Nasir type group versus 15% in the control group. Uh, I think this is, is looking to pick a fight. Um, I, none of the people needed dialysis. Uh, a lot of them returned back to baseline. I think you're, you know, you're just looking to pick on the, on the drug. Um, I'm not sure that's really clinically significant. The number four, though, is uh, clinically significant. Uh, they looked at the uh, risk of death. Meta-analysis, 862 patients. Nasiratide versus anything else. 30-day mortality, 7.2% versus 4%. Hazard ratio is 1.74. That's a little bit scary for an expensive drug uh, to not only um, bankrupt you and then, and then kill you. Um, it's probably not a good thing. Uh, again, these numbers, these mortality rates seem awful high. Um, but at any rate, that's what they found. And then uh, number five, this is more for the um, primary care people. It, it, it became very fashionable for our cardiologists to send somebody in uh, to admit somebody to the hospital and put them on an acetide drip for a day or two to kind of tune them up and then... Um, send them home. And this is an editorial from um, New England Journal of Medicine where they said there's absolutely no, no justification for that. There's no data at all that giving somebody a blast of nasiratide is going to make them any better than anything else. So the question is, if you look in, in general, the first five uh, articles all are, are pretty critical uh, of, the, of the drug. I will tell you there are um, uh, some, there are, is some literature out there that does say it has some benefit. And I do think there is a subset of people who, with congestive heart, fa heart failure, who will benefit from the drug. Um, and I'm not a drug, so I'm, not, I'm a nobody speaker's bureau, so he, um, I'm not shilling for it. But I think it is, but it's one of those drugs where we don't know who that group is. Uh, and right now there's a lot of much cheaper drugs that do a very good job of treating CHF. And until you find that, who that subset is, it's a little bit difficult to, to justify using it. Next question talks about uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, uh, six and seven. Um, the, uh, they looked at a uh, total of 24 patients, relatively stable patients, elevated pulmonary copy web pressure. And what they found is they stuck these people on uh, BiPAP or CPAP, and all of a sudden they got better and they did much, um, uh, what's the name, their, their CHF did much better. I'm just going to blow through the articles and we're going to talk a little bit. Number eight was uh, actually a study out of our place, looked at BiPAP, severe CHF, 20 Two patients avoided endotracheal intubation in 20 of those. Um, number nine is another meta-analysis, 180 patients, 6.6% uh, reduction in mortality, 26% reduction in intubation. Um, number 10, uh, randomized controlled child um, BiPAP, CPAP versus oxygen, 37%. 5% intubation rate in the BiPAP group, 33% in the control group. Um, they, all these articles say pretty much the same thing. It works. Here's the question. How does it work and why should you use it? If I ask the question, how many people keep a BiPAP, CPAP uh, unit in their emergency department? Okay. How many people have to call respiratory down to hook it up or you guys hook it up yourself? How many people hook it up themselves? Yeah, that's the, that's the key to it. You really want to be using, just, you know, know how to do it and just walk them over and put the people right on it yourself. Um, you don't have respiratory come down and take the laryngoscope out of the, the intubation box and hand it to you. Same thing with this thing. It, it should, our sits there fully primed and you know, we just literally walk it over and, and place it on somebody. And the nice thing about being the person who places it on yourself is the following. You, you, some people need a little bit of coaching to tolerate. You have this person, they're blue as a squid, they're dripping sweat, they're mottled. <sighs> I can't breathe. You put an oxygen mask on them, what do they do? They take it off. It's like, oh my God, this person's doing bad. You've got to literally take that mask, squash it on their face, and say, just hold still and take five deep breaths. Because that's all it takes is five deep breaths to turn these people around. If you're not doing that, if you call respiratory down, number one, by the time they get down there, it's 10, 15 minutes. Whereas it take, should take you less than 30 seconds to just wheel to the bedside and put it on the person. And number two, they're not as committed to it as you are. It's like, come on, you can do this. Just take some deep breaths, you can do it. Parameters you start with, if you have a CPAP, 20, CC, 20 centimeters of water is your starting pressure. If you've got BiPAP, 20 over 15, your IPAP is your inspiratory pressure, your EPAP is your uh, expiratory pressure. 20 over 15 is the minimum you want to start with. And you put them on 100% oxygen. And set up so they breathe spontaneously. You don't want this thing timed because they're going to they're gonna override any timer on it. And you may have to put it on them, take it off for a second, put it on, take it off for a second, um, but you literally have to be standing at the bedside putting this on their face. You've got to coach them through those first five, six breaths. Once you do that, you're home free. They're going to go, 
hey, this thing works, and they'll actually um, do it. Now, how does the BiPAP work? Well, there's a, a number of different mechanisms when you look at it. It only works if you have an elevated car, um, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. If you put it in somebody who, uh, for in this instance, you can put it on COPDers and it'll work for a whole different mechanism, but the mechanisms that work for congestive heart failure only function when you have an ele elevated wedge pressure. Your cardiac output, everybody in this room's cardiac output is determined by your preload right now, because your wedge pressures are probably down around 12 or so. Uh, so your, your output is determined by how much blood you can stuff into your left ventricle, and that'll determine your cardiac output. Once you've maximized the amount of blood in that left ventricle, you're pouring as much blood in there as you can, your cardiac output is determined only by your afterload. So these people have, their, their lungs are full of fluid, their wedge pressures are through the roof, they've got as much fluid as they can in their left ventricle, their pulmonary capillary wedge, their, their cardiac output is determined strictly by their afterload. So you've got to do a couple things to them. You've got to in, drop their afterload so the left ventricle can empty out a little bit, and you've got to do a couple things to their lungs to make them breathe a little bit easier. First is, they're working really hard to breathe. Well, why are they working really hard to breathe? Well, part of it is, They've got all this fluid in their alveoli. What happens when you take and put fluid in the alveolus? Whether you do it with pneumonia, you do it with a transudate from CHF. The answer is the following. An alveoli is basically a sphere. And if you, it's got the surfactant la layer on it. So when you take a breath in and you exhale, as you exhale, all your alveoli collapse in the lower part of your lungs. When you take your next breath in, you have to open all those alveoli back up. The reason they open and close effortlessly is because they're lined with surfactant. If you wash the surfactant out, the alveoli become very stiff. Once they become very stiff, it becomes very difficult to open them back up. So these people are basically, every time they take a breath, they have to change the amount of oxygen they, they divert to breathing from 4%, which is what you're using at rest now, to about 25%. So they're using 25% of their oxygen just to open these stiff alveoli. And if you don't believe it, go and take a balloon, one of those little round balloons, and try and blow it up. The first puff you make into that balloon to pop it open is really hard. Once you've got it popped open, what happens? It just blows up effortlessly. Same thing with the alveoli. So when you wash out that surfactant, a lot of effort to, to blow it back, to open it back up. Stick somebody on the BiPAP or the CPAP, what happens? During both inspiration and expiration, the alveoli never collapse. They stay open the whole time. So if they're staying open the whole time, you don't have to expend any energy to open them back up. In addition, what's an open alveoli do? An open alveoli exchanges gases. A collapsed alveoli doesn't. So whereas everybody in this room, the only time you're exchanging any gas and getting rid of carbon dioxide, bringing in your oxygen, is, at, is when you, at the end of inspiration. As soon as you, your breath is done, you start to exhale, all of a sudden you stop exchanging gases from the, the bottom of your lungs all the way up. What you've done with these people, you put them on the BiPAP, you keep the alveoli open, now they can exchange gas through both phases of the respiratory cycle. So what happens? They exchange more gas, their oxygen goes up, their carbon dioxide goes down. So now they're oxygenating a little bit better. So that, so that works in their favor. You've also put a positive pressure on them that's distributed throughout the whole thoracic cavity. So when you put somebody on BiPAP, it's not just the lungs. The entire thoracic cavity sees this increase in pressure. So what's the first thing that happens? Well, it's like intubating somebody uh, and putting them on PEEP. You decrease the venous return. You've got a higher pressure in the chest than you do elsewhere in the body. Less blood comes back into the chest. What's that do? That stops this blood from pouring into the lungs by, this, you know, by your right ventricle, and you basically you're shutting off the faucet that's pouring the water into the bathtub. So you decrease the pulmonary venous return. So that now, now you've stopped that. Does it help any in emptying out the, um, the left ventricle? Turns out that from the heart's perspective, when you put the BiPAP on somebody, the heart sees this big increase in intrathoracic pressure. But once you leave the chest, once the blood leaves the chest, that pressure goes away. So when it looks out of the chest, it sees the abdominal aorta, everything down there, everything in the carotids and everything else. There's a drop in pressure as soon as the blood leaves the thoracic cavity. The heart interprets that as a drop in afterload. And if you take somebody on BiPAP, if you take somebody in congestive heart failure and you put them on BiPAP, you can actually watch their cardiac output go up about 400. So it's very dramatic. That's why, they, how many people have seen that? Guys, absolutely blue as a squid, dying in front of you. You stick them on the BiPAP. Within about a minute, this guy looks great. Anybody seen that? Yeah, you all have. And the reason is all those mechanisms kick in at once. This guy's cardiac output just doubled right before your eyes. Their um, pulmonary venous return just halved. So all of a sudden, these people get dramatically, dramatically better. The key to it is, unlike a lot of other therapies, there is an art to it. 
you've got to be able to stand there beside them and coax them through those first couple breaths on the BiPAP. There are some studies out there that say, oh, it didn't work, it doesn't change long-term intubation rates. Every time you look at those studies, what you find is people did stupid things. They did stuff like, we started them on uh, a BiPAP of 5 over 3 and titrated them over the next half hour up to therapeutic levels. You don't. You start these people on 20 over 15. You, know, you don't have time to titrate them up. You don't have time to get Mr. Jones used to the mask. It's right on them, and it's, it's right at your maximum levels from the very, very beginning. What I will tell you that we do, and we, and we, we use a lot of it, and at the end I'll tell you exactly uh, how we do some, some stuff, but um, we, we basically um, have started to use it not just on the real severe patients, but on the moderately sick patients that are uncomfortable. So like, we started out using it on the really bad pulmonary edemas, and it worked great. I mean, our, our statistics are clearly avoiding intubation in 95 plus percent of the bad uh, pulmonary edemas. Then we start to look at it on, you know, the people who come in, they're, they're working, but they're not working real hard. They're uncomfortable. They can hold the conversation with you. We stick it on those people, too. They're only on it for about a half an hour to an hour, but, but it gives it a time for the rest of their medicines to kick in. I will also tell you, the minute you put somebody on BiPAP, your goal as either the, the general internist or the emergency physician is to wean them off of it. A lot of times we, we, we intubate people and we go, okay, they're intubated through somebody else's headache. We don't have enough beds. We, we've got intubated patients sitting down there all the time. We've got people on BiPAP down there all the time. Put them on the BiPAP, um, and as soon as they're on it, within 15, 20 minutes, you're dialing them down to get them weaned off. And we wean about 80 plus percent of the people off the BiPAP in the emergency department down to just um, you know, um, supplemental oxygen. And they go from unit to step down to telemetry bed. And your odds of getting a telemetry bed are a whole lot better than getting a unit bed uh, on these people. All right, you put them on the BiPAP, but there's some other things that you ought to be doing to them besides just that, because there's, there's other things you can do to make them feel better. Number 13 is the first of a number of studies that look at captopril and the ACE inhibitors in the acute management of pulmonary edema. How many people, Louie comes in, blue as a squid, diaphoretic, sweating like crazy, blood pressure's 250 over 150, um, everybody, I mean, the security guard says, oh, Louie's here with pulmonary edema. So everybody knows what he's got, um, how many people take and put a uh, 25 milligrams of captopril under his tongue? Yeah, it's a handful of people. How's it work? It works spectacular. I mean, if you look at the data on it, um, first study is uh, you basically get an improvement in about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, second study was a real nice study out of Hamilton, sublingual captopril, uh, decreased endotra endotracheal intubation rates from 20% down to 10%. Uh, number 15 is a German study, looks at IV um, uh, captopril drop in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, generally about 5-10 minutes after you, after you give the, uh, the medicine. It's absorbed very, very quickly. Um, so what you, you basically wind up doing is you have somebody who comes in pulmonary edema, uh, first thing you generally do is you're giving them nitrates. So you're putting two, three sublingual nitroglycerins under the tongue. We generally will start with one or two. At the same time, you put 25 milligrams of captopril under there, but the captopril pills um, don't dissolve, so you, you have to put like a couple drops of water on it to get the thing to dissolve. Or if you're, you can get your pharmacy to make it up, it's a capsule, you can just pull it apart and put the powder under there. It dissolves a little bit better. Stick them on the BiPAP. Within 15 minutes, they're looking spectacular. Within a half an hour, you've weaned them, that you're starting to wean them off their BiPAP, and within about an hour, hour and a half, you've gotten them much better. So the, the key to it is, you're going to attack them on multiple fronts. You're going to use your BiPAP to buy you enough time to get your medicines to work. You're going to give them the, your nitrates to kind of peripherally vasodilate them. You're going to give the, uh, the captopril to peripherally afterload reduce them. You will, you will recognize that if you, where's the, the general internist in, in the group? What happens if you send somebody home from the hospital with the diagnosis of CHF and you haven't put them on an ACE inhibitor? What happens? Hospital comes and yells at you, right? My God, you're making us look bad for the, um, the, the pro study and, and those kind of things. Um, so if it works for somebody who's, you know, tuned up in their CHF, it should work even better for somebody um, uh, who's um, uh, in, in, you know, bad shape. It has a very quick onset. The other thing that's nice about it is we have a huge renal population. I mean, absolutely gigantic, gigantic um, renal failure population. Those people have no IV access at all. They are routinely managed with no IVs and just sublingual captopril, sublingual nitroglycerin, BiPAP. They come, um, 
uh, the um, dialysis unit comes down, they dialyze them in the emergency department. These are people with flat out respiratory failure, PCO2s in the hundreds. Um, they, they get weaned off the BiPAP and they go home from the emergency department. Before we started using those therapies, these people routinely got admitted to the ICU for two or three days. Yeah, question. Uh, if they're on ACE inhibitors, that's absolutely the, the one group that definitely gets it. And the reason is, the, I'll tell you the one group that doesn't get it. The one group is if you come in and you're in pulmonary edema, and I know your doctor's one of, the, one of the internists on staff or the primary care docs on staff who's a really good doc and I trust them. And I look at your med list and you're not on an ACE inhibitor, then I know that there's a reason you're not on it. And those people you go with something like hydralazine. But if they're on it, like you look and you see there's lisinopril there, perfect. They're the people you feel real comfortable giving it to. You don't have to worry about it. Um, now, I, I will warn you, when you give it to them, a couple of things happen. One is you make them better. These people have a huge adrenergic surge going on. They, they basically have a sympathetic crisis going on. That's why they're hypertensive. They're, they're basically dying, so they've kicked in all their flight or flight reset, re reflexes. The renin-angiotensin system is revved up and everything else. And so what happens is once you make them better and they shut off their fight or flight reflex, uh, you're going to see a drop in their blood pressure. And somebody's going to come up and scream and yell at you, my God, their blood pressure is 90, you blithering idiot, what's going on there? But if you go and look at the patient, this person's like bright pink, sitting up, happy as can be, uh, and they do very well. Their pressure will just drift back up on its own. You don't have to give them any fluids or, or pressors or anything else. It'll, it'll just kind of come back on its own. But uh, you, you should be aware of that. Now, the other thing that the Captopril does that a lot of people don't recognize is because you've revved up, these people are very, very hyperadrenergic, you know, they, they, and that's why they're so hypertensive and everything else, uh, is you get a lot of um, uh, systolic and di or diastolic dysfunction in the left ventricle. They've got increased peripheral vascular resistance, that's why they're hy so hypertensive, um, from all the uh, catecholamines they have circulating around. But the other thing the catecholamines will do is they'll stiffen that ventricle. So a lot of these people will get diastolic dysfunction as well. Um, and I, I never really understood diastolic dysfunction until I saw somebody with a um, radial nerve palsy, and then it, I finally figured it out. It makes no sense at all why you should go into congestive heart failure if your ventricle can't relax. I mean, it makes a whole lot of sense if you've got a, a couple of infarcts or you've got an ischemic area and the ventricle can't pump that you would go into congestive heart failure. But what the hell difference does it make if it can't relax? In fact, if it can't relax, it's a smaller ventricle. And don't we always say, well, you know, geez, you know, you've got a big heart, you must have problems. You have a small heart, you must be in good shape. Well, it turns out that there is actually uh, an optimum length that the, the myocytes have to be in order to contract with any force. Uh, and the way you can figure this out, and the way and actually um, we, we, I finally figured it out was when this guy came in with a radial nerve palsy, because he said he kept dropping things. And he kept dropping things, because what do you have when you have a radial nerve palsy? Your hand sits like this. Take your wrist and bend it down like this and try and make a fist. You have absolutely no strength in that at all. Now, take your wrist back to where it should be and make a fist. You've got a lot of strength there. The reason is, this is diastolic dysfunction. The muscles in your forearm are too short. Okay, diastolic dysfunction means they're not relaxed, they're not stretched out to the proper length. Here's your heart trying to beat with diastolic dysfunction. No wonder you're in congestive heart failure. You give them the captopril, turn off the renin-angiotensin system, shut down their catecholamine surge, allow the ventricle to relax and the myocytes come out to length, and now you've got all the strength you need to, to um, get your contractility back. So it make, that's, that's part of the reason it makes such a big difference in these people. It's very dramatic uh, when you, you give it as well. I will tell you there are people like Amal Matu, um, who does a lot of um, research in this area as well, and what he, what he uses is IV enalapril. Um, and that's fine, I, I, don't, I have zero problem with that. That's, um, but at our site, we can generally get the, uh, the sublingual stuff in quicker than you can get an IV or anything else in, in these folks. Um, the final question looks at diuretics. The truth of the matter is you really don't need diuretics. 50% of the people in pulmonary edema are not fluid overloaded. It's just an afterload contractility problem. You get them better that you don't need to, to diurese most of those people. And that's why you notice in the initial management, nobody talked about giving them uh, diuretics. Interesting thing is people always just say, well, oh, if you give them Lasix, that's a pulmonary vasodilator. It'll make them better. If you put a, a, a swan into somebody and give them Lasix, actually their pulmonary capillary wedge pressure goes up. 
Uh, now everybody's going to say, I give a lot of people Lasix and they don't get any worse. It goes up marginally and it probably doesn't make any difference because these people are so sick anyway. But it, it's, it's not a therapy. It's not very therapeutic, more importantly. And I mean, a lot of times you don't have to diurese them. But there is some data that if you give more than a milligram per kilogram, after about 15 minutes it becomes a vasoconstrictor. Uh, so it actually increases their afterload, so it's not a good thing to do. The last article uh, talks about... Um, the, I'm sorry, the, the last section actually talks about the idea of instead of giving them this whopping bolus of uh, Lasix, you probably get a better effect if you just give them an infusion. Give them, you know, a small dose as an IV bolus and then put them on an infusion, uh, and the, the drips tend to do much better um, than the, um, uh, the, the bolus infusions on those folks. I will tell you um, at our institution, and, and we probably see two, three people um, uh, a month, uh, or two, three people a week like this. Um, our intubation rate for, for pulmonary edema, unless you are pretty much agonal, um, we can pretty much get you through. And our nurses are huge advocates of this, and it makes a big difference. Uh, they're like, you know, if you even think about intubating, they're going, oh, come on, you weenie. You know, get, just, you can get them through this. You know, we don't want this ventilated patient down here, because once they're on the ventilator, you know you're stuck with them. Um, and you can actually get these people... Um, you know, through this very, very easily. And the nurses are like, you know, as soon as you, you're putting the BiPAP on them, they're, they're already cracking open the captopril, um, and they've got a, um, a little fluid to, to squirt under the tongue to get the nitrates, the captopril, the BiPAP. 15 minutes, you're starting to wean them down off of it. If you think they're fluid overloaded, you can, you can uh, give them a little bit of a diuretic. But most of those people should be weaned off the BiPAP and ready to go to a, uh, a regular bed. The only other thing I will warn you is somebody is going to quote you an article that says, uh, bike pap uh, causes MIs. That they did a study up in Rhode Island, and what they found was when they, they had two groups of people, one was CPAP, one was BiPAP, and they put them on, um, they, they put both the groups on it, and the BiPAP group all made enzymes, and the CPAP group didn't. And it, it, actually, what happens is the following. And you, it, you'll see it at your institution, where, and we do have to fight with the cardiologists about this because they never believe us. When you put somebody on the BiPAP, and you get all the physiologic things that we talked about, you get a very rapid drop in the um, left ventricular uh, wall tension. It just, I mean, it just precipitously drops. And when you do that, you wash out anything that's sitting there. And so anytime you go and get bad pulmonary edema and stuff, you get a couple of myocytes that get bumped off. You get a little bit of enzyme leakage in there. If you take and you, you know, put them on either CPAP or treat them traditionally, what you will do is gradually bring down the left ventricular wall tension. As you bring it down, those enzymes will slowly wash back into the general circulation, and you'll see this very low kind of uh, minimal elevation in the enzymes, but it never gets to the threshold that you would call NMI. It's, it never hits the positive point. If you put them on the BiPAP, what you see is a very dramatic drop, and you wash everything out in a matter of minutes, what you will see is you wash all that same amount of enzymes, but you wash them out in a couple minutes, you see a big spike in their cardiac enzymes, and a lot of them turn positive. But if you look at the area under the curve, it's the same area under the curve, they just washed it out much quicker. And what you'll see is the first set of enzymes, you know, maybe an hour after you put them on the BiPAP is positive, but the enzymes after that, all of a sudden, they're back to normal real quick. I mean, it just it, it drops precipitously. So they're not having MIs, you're not causing MIs on those people. What you're just seeing is a more rapid washout. And it's funny because we, we fight with the, um, uh, the cardiologists. They, they take them to the cath lab. They have positive enzymes. They're taking them to the cath lab. It's like, I wouldn't do that. Uh, they take them out to the cath lab, and almost inevitably the, um, uh, the coronaries are normal on them. So, All right. 